Hey everyone, my name is Rob Wagner. I'm the host of the Creation Q&A Live on Fridays at 10 a.m. Um, I'm excited to come to you from the Discovery Center. We have a very special episode for you today of Dr. Thomas and Dr. Clary taking questions that you previously submitted about dinosaurs in our Discovery Center, which, by the way, is now open to the public. So if you'd like to visit us in Dallas, Texas, you can come to our Discovery Center and we'd love to have you. So I hope you enjoy the special episode again with Dr. Thomas and Dr. Clary as they discuss dinosaurs. Well, hi everybody, I'm Dr. Brian Thomas, paleobiochemistry. That's a big word that means I study uh, proteins in fossils. And I'm here at the ICR, that's Institute for Creation Research Discovery Center, with my colleague, geologist, Dr. Tim Clary. What are we doing here today, Tim? Well, we're going to do a little Q&A about dinosaurs today. So Brian's uh, the expert on the inside of the dinosaurs and the outside. And, and I try to help as a geologist. I, I've done a little dinosaur digging, and so I have a little experience on dinosaurs as well including a book that's out there for sale. Uh, you've got books for sale on dinosaurs as well. i got Dinosaurs in the Bible, contributed to ICR's Guide to Dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yours is the yeah, Bible that we have. Yeah. The dinosaur Bible that we have is oh, yeah. the one you wrote. So that well, was great. It's, it's, and it's called? Dinosaurs, Marvels of God's Design. Marvels of God's Design. And in there, in all these resources we mm -hmm. talk about, we actually answer in those resources some of the questions right. that we'll look at today. So we have collated uh, these questions from folks who watch us online, folks who follow us on Facebook, and um, uh, our events department's putting this together, and the events guys mm -hmm. said, hey, what kind of questions do you guys want mm -hmm. answered? And so thank you for submitting these questions, and we're going to try to, mm -hmm. to to look at some of these. You've got the paper, I'll start. so I'll you're, start. you're in control. Okay, I'll start with the first question. Okay. Uh, what distinguishes dinosaurs from the large lizards we have today? Am I supposed to answer this one? Or yes. Or well, we both can, but you go okay. ahead first. <laughs> well, dinosaur, dinosaurs and large lizards. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs are extinct. Large lizards are not yet. Um, and, and they're, yeah, they're alive. But you can see these large lizards, mm -hmm. they, have, they have legs positioned in a way that sort of goes out from the body mm -hmm. and then down to, toward the ground. So like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Their legs are sort of out and then down. And then, but the dinosaur reptiles had a different anatomy. They had their legs that went straight down. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the camera can pick mm -hmm. up sort of the the bottom of the T-Rex here, but you can see T-Rex's legs are positioned beneath the body. Mm -hmm. And he was big enough mm -hmm. to where he had to have that. If you stick mm -hmm. alligator legs that go out and then down, mm -hmm. T-Rex would have just crawled around in the mud and wouldn't mm -hmm. have been able to get up and get around because the physics would be, he'd be mm -hmm. too heavy for this position, for this structure to support them. Anyways, but even small dinosaurs had legs that go straight down. But the what we call the open acetabulum is what um, all dinosaurs had, mm -hmm. and that's just a um, the hip socket was a was a was you could see right through it. So the femur bone would come up and, and articulate with the hip socket or the or the acetabulum, which is a hole in the hip. Uh, in us, it's a cup, and so in in mm -hmm. mammals, including humans, the femur it articulates in a cup like this. Mm -hmm. In birds, it's a cup. Some extinct mm -hmm. birds, it's a partial cup. But in dinosaurs, it was just mm -hmm. open. And so mm -hmm. the, the femur would, um, would, would, um, yeah, would connect with a, a big old vacant hole, probably filled in with connective tissue and mm -hmm. things like that. So is it, does that answer the It's probably way too much detail well, than what anyone wants. I want to add one other thing. And the geology confirms that. We, when we look at the footprints of dinosaurs, we see they're very close together. Mm -hmm. Just like you would walk if you were a mammal, uh, so they're not sprawled out like crocodiles and turtles and reptiles today. These are reptiles that walked with their legs erect, even four-legged and two-legged. And so we see the footprints; they almost step on top of each other with the four legs sometimes. And so and there's no tail draggings. Uh, so if they were sprawling like crocodiles, we'd see tail draggings. We'd see these animals, you know. But the the, the rocks support the interpretation that Sir Richard Owen came up with in 1841 that. These are a unique group of reptiles that had an erect posture. Well, you say no tail drags. There's probably a few, mm -hmm. but generally. But only with, yeah, I, I did hear about one where they were walking in mud so deep mm -hmm. that their tails were dragging. And, but in most cases, that's not Really the case. deep footprints right. that go mm -hmm. way down, yeah. 
So yeah. they held their tail aloft. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so so this is in contrast to some of the earlier models of mm -hmm. dinosaurs. The ones that I sort of grew mm -hmm. up with in the 70s, I am that old, <laughs> uh, where they had these, you know, these gray colored mm -hmm. uh, um, dinosaurs with, mm -hmm. with the tails that were drooping down. They looked mm -hmm. so sad, stuck in the mm -hmm. swamp. I can't get out, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... So speaking of gray color, I think I saw a question, a question about that. that. Well, we can jump ahead to that. Yes, yeah, were all dinosaurs really gray? Yeah, I think that's a that's an early. That's from pictures, mm -hmm. and some artists mm -hmm. decided to show dinosaurs that mm -hmm. way a long time ago, and they mm -hmm. also decided to show dinosaurs with droopy tails that dragged. Mm -hmm. uh, but closer um, uh, examination of the mm -hmm. anatomy, I'm thinking, of course, of Brontosaurus, mm -hmm. like the classic. Um, sauropod four-legged dinosaur right. and its tail didn't drag and we can okay. tell because you could look at the um, the linkages where the muscles and the ligaments would have linked between the vertebrae mm -hmm. and it would have been a, you, you, it would have held this vertebra here this one here and it would have been mm -hmm. you know it would have been held aloft nice mm -hmm. and tight uh, and it, mm -hmm. it didn't have to drag around you know like it's like it's carrying a, um, a wedding veil or something Right. Well, really heavy wedding veil. Speaking of which, velociraptors actually have a straightened tail mm -hmm. as they would get these ossified tendons. And so their tail was flexible where it came off the body, but then it would stay straight. And there is actually muscles they show that are attached. They believe that each step it took, the tail was swinging back and forth to balance the animal. But many of the dinosaurs actually had these straightened tails. They couldn't, I mean, they weren't really that flexible, but they were built to balance the front end, balance them around that hip. If it's a two-legged animal, it's balanced on the hip. If it's four-legged, they're balanced on you know, both hips. But, but there's a lot of hip and shoulder. evidence in the fossils themselves that supports this in addition. So back to the color question. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they were all gray at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I know of one study of a Psittacosaurus, mm -hmm. it's fun to say, mm -hmm. and um, they found, Vinther and uh, colleagues found, uh, pigments still mm -hmm. in the skin. It's like a naturally mummified mm -hmm. dinosaur carcass, mm -hmm. which itself is something mm -hmm. to talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> we will. We will. We will. Okay. Uh, but they found it's darker on its back mm -hmm. and lighter colored on its belly. Mm -hmm. So we don't have the integrity of the mm -hmm. pigment uh, so high that we can tell exactly what colors, mm -hmm. but we right. can tell the shades of some of these mm -hmm. dinosaurs because they're Skin is still there mm -hmm. in some cases, and it's preserved. Like, wow, how does that happen? And there's melanosomes. melanosomes. Yeah, the, in some cases, some mm -hmm. melanosomes, which is mm -hmm. the, it's, it's a cell. It's still intact. Mm -hmm. The cell, um, yeah, turns into a melanosome, mm -hmm. which is a pigment, uh, pigmented uh, structure. Mm -hmm. And so you can look inside those and go, oh, well, this is dark or this is light. Mm -hmm. And so that's similar to what you see on a deer. We've got the dark back mm -hmm. and the light belly, and it's good. Um, it's a good uh, sort of a camouflage shading for a creature that would live in a forested or treed environment. So, probably, I mean, maybe they had different colors. I don't mm -hmm. think they were wild, full of fancy colors mm -hmm. like birds. Mm -hmm. I don't think that at all. There's no evidence for mm -hmm. that. But I don't think either that they were just drab and gray mm -hmm. every single one. You know, they had they had different shades. They may have had some different mm -hmm. subtle colors. Probably greenish. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. think that some modern reptiles might have a greenish. Well, if I remember right, I think even some stripes might have existed on some of the tails. There's some of those melanosomes, I believe, on Sinosopteryx, I believe, that showed maybe like a, a brown and white pattern, or even that that hadrosaur called Dakota. I think they found what appeared to be sort of striped patterns in this in their well-preserved skin. And so it's possible that, and there's even, I believe there was a study done several years back about some of the marine fossils like turtles that, that might have had almost a black and white coloring to them, almost like a killer whale. And so it's possible, you know, those animals were a little different color. Really dark on the really back. Really dark on the back. And really light really on the front. belly. Yeah. And so it's, we don't know, but in the future, because the preservation we're finding is so good, we may have better ideas on the colors. But I agree with you. They're not all gray. They, you know, this might be a little much, the green behind us, but uh, who and knows? He's got some strength. You know, he's got some, looks pretty good. Okay, we'll kind of get back to how many dinosaurs do you think got off the ark? Or, you know, what, some people wonder were dinosaurs even on the ark? 
Mm. And, uh, but we, you know, we at ICR, we believe that God's word is true. And then he said two of every kind were on the ark. And so I'll just leave. How many, how many do you well, think two, God offers? The two of every kind of, of land dwelling, mm -hmm. air breathing mm -hmm. uh, creature. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Genesis 7 specifies two of every kind of creature mm -hmm. that lived on land and had the breath of life in its nostrils. Mm -hmm. And if you look at dinosaur fossils, you can see those nostrils were there. So they walked on land, uh, or at least they could walk on land, mm -hmm. um, and they had mm -hmm. nostrils. So mm -hmm. I think that qualifies them as being ark inhabitants. And um, uh, so, agree. yeah. So, so then the next question is how many? How many? And so mm -hmm. to answer that, you have done some research on that, and you would say well, you were there, right? And so you just count them. I am older than you, yes. Uh, I've been about a decade or so in there longer. But uh, no, I never saw a dinosaur that I didn't like. I uh, <laughs> only found the bones. Uh, but I think there's maybe a minimum or maybe even a maximum of about 60 kinds. There's about 60 families of dinosaurs, and many creationists, uh, creation biologists, believe the family was somewhat comparable to the dinosaur, to the kind of animal that the Bible refers to. And so there's probably at least 60, there, there could have been more. I think in my book I say 60, but there might have been 60, 70, maybe even 80 kinds of dinosaurs. But there's not thousands of dinosaurs. There's, you know, there's been over 1,500 or so species named. But if you're a paleontologist, you would find the bones of different dog breeds and you would name them all different species as well because they all look different. And so species are Slightly named. Different. Right. Species are named, yeah, just as very subtle things when they name a new species because it gives them a publication. And then obviously they try to get more research money, the more publications you have. You kind of build your academic credentials through publications. And you know that's one of the reasons why there's so many dinosaurs out there. But there's really only 60, maybe 70, possibly 80 kinds of dinosaurs. So you really need double that on the ark, male and female. And as I talk about, and you've talked about, probably juveniles around the ark, you wouldn't have full size T-Rexes like this probably on the ark. Uh, they take up a lot of room and they eat a lot and maybe not be, you know, as a certain size, maybe they couldn't breed. You know, we, don't, we don't know. We don't know enough about dinosaurs to really know. But the young ones, of course, before they hit their growth spurt, would have uh, been most likely, but again, we don't know for sure. So how many, uh, we're talking about, let's say 70 roughly mm -hmm. families. And a family, um, which we're which we're using as a rough equivalent mm -hmm. to kind, and in the and scripture says two of every kind. Mm -hmm. So we're saying probably two of every family, mm -hmm. uh, using the modern Linnaean classification, mm -hmm. kingdom final class order family genus species, mm -hmm. uh, would be for example the Triceratops mm -hmm. is a species or mm -hmm. a genus, Triceratops. Horridus, I think, is the species yeah, name. Yeah, one of them. Yeah, one but, of them. So that's one of them. But the family name is Ceratopsian. Mm. It's a, or, well, it's a Ceratopsian. So, so that's the tank-like dinosaurs with a big mm. frill. Some, some yeah. of them had a frill. Some of them had horns. Some had mm. no horns. Mm -hmm. But it's short neck, tank-like mm. body, four legs mm. on the floor. Um, and uh, so all those mm -hmm. fit in that kind. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's Taurosaurus, mm -hmm. uh, Centrosaurus, there's Triceratops, and, and many others. But they're all in the same kind. Yeah. The same. So all you need is two Ceratopsians to come on board yeah. the ark. There's, yeah, there may be there may be a couple. There's a couple of them in there. There's Neoceratopsians and there's a couple. Of, it, the problem is it gets very complicated, as you know, because they find things, they reclassify things, mm -hmm. and they're not really using the Linnaean hierarchy anymore. They're using more cladistical analysis, yeah. which is based on. Statistics and subjective, yeah, traits, like subjective I think traits. this trait and yeah. I think that trait is and more important. So, so they end up with all crazy. this. And so it's, it's more and more difficult to figure out how many real families there were. Mm. But God loved variety. I mean, just like we all look different. All the dinosaurs look different. Family units seem to pull out different traits. And so we see different numbers of horns on the Ceratopsians and, and you know, two horns, three horns. Uh, there's a lot of variety. But they're all the basic body type, like you said, and even when they're born. So let's say 70. So it's 140. Yeah. yeah it's not that so 140, many. the average size of dinosaurs. You did a big study on this. Yeah, we did we, we did the math. Jeff Tompkins and I at ICR did the math and we figured out the average adult size was the size of the American bison or buffalo. But if they were juveniles, they might have been size of sheep, adult sheep. So they might have been fairly small. So if you don't if you don't take the big mm -hmm. daddy mm -hmm. T Rex, you just take a, a, a mm -hmm. teenage T Rex. Mm -hmm. 
And if you don't take the big daddy, you know, a patasaurus, mm-hmm. you just take the little 11 year old, mm-hmm. little, yeah. <laughs> he, he would still be, you know, yeah. 20, 30 feet long or whatever. But, but not 130. But not 130 mm-hmm. feet long. And so you put those on board the ark, mm-hmm. and the average size would be something like a sheep. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, so you have 140 sheep. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, we've done feasibility studies mm-hmm. on that. And uh, would, that would take up one corner of one of the three decks of mm-hmm. Noah's Ark, leaving plenty of space for, for all the, all the other, other kinds. animal mm-hmm. kinds. So, so then they got off the Ark. Mm-hmm. And what happened? Well, that's the next interesting question. Is it really? But we'll get to the what happened to the ultimate result later. But here's a question when they got off the Ark. Were any dinosaurs domesticated and used as pets, do you think? This is a serious question. It's, it's, on, the, it's on our script, it's so a, yes. <laughs> I think it's as likely to domest- to have domesticated <laughs> a dinosaur as it is to try to domesticate a crocodile today. Mm-hmm. That's right. what I think. I agree. I mean, but I wasn't there, and I, I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to say. That's, that's one of those questions where I don't know if we're ever going to know the answer while we're here on this earth. Yeah, it's like asking about, you, the, know. you know, did dinosaurs brush their teeth? Well, we yeah. don't or, know their behavior. Well, the next question is, what do they taste like? But they taste like. Yeah, yeah. That's, did they taste like chicken? That's or? what that's. I think someone planted that yeah. in there just so we could say it tastes like chicken. Well, I would assume they taste like crocodiles, which crocodiles do have a kind of a white meat affinity to chicken. So you've had crocodile. Yeah. Ooh. Maybe it's alligator. I don't know. I no. guess it's alligator. He used to have alligator on a stick. Back in the day <laughs> in Louisiana, so it wasn't really a crocodile, I guess. But alligator. I'm yeah, sure it tastes it similar. Tastes very similar. So. Uh, so here I am, Dr. Brian Thomas, this is mm-hmm. Dr. Tim Clary, mm-hmm. and we're at the ICR Discovery Center in Dallas, Texas. Come visit us here, please. If you're mm-hmm. anywhere near North Texas, um, you, you're not going to want to miss um, what we have on display here. This is just one room mm-hmm. of many rooms. And what, we're, what are we trying to do with this Discovery Center in general? I would say we're trying to showcase and illustrate mm-hmm. the science that supports Scripture and so, just why is why why do you work here? And tell me why. I know I'm becoming an interviewer. <laughs> sorry, but that's okay. Uh, why do you think this is important? What we do here? Well, I think it's it's, it's critical that we show people that God's word is true, mm. and that real science, unlike what you're taught in many of the universities and colleges and high schools and public institutions, real science supports the Bible. Real mm. science shows there was a flood. And in my research as a geologist, I plot up sediments and compile sedimentary rock records all over the world. And I'm not quite full through the whole world, but I've gotten through part of it now. And that's showing each continent, you know, doing the same things at the same time, flooding Wait, at the so same all, level. All the continents the have time. the same pattern? The same general pattern to all the continents. They all begin kind of gradual flooding and then they become progressively more and more and more up to a point. And then they, the water, you can see the water receding, pushing sediments offshore. And so you see that same general so receding pattern. receding water sediments. Where'd you get that word receding? It sounds familiar to me. Well, I think that's in the Bible. <laughs> After day 150, the water started to recede, the Bible talks about. And so the rocks really do show exactly what the Bible says. And that's, that's one of the things that at, at ICR we do is we show that real science confirms the youthfulness of our universe, the youthfulness of the earth, the re- recent flood, the dinosaurs were real, you know, there are some people that still doubt whether dinosaurs are real, but when you dig them up like you and I have done, we know they're real. And, and the Bible tells us they were on the ark because they were land-dwelling, air-breathing animals, so they've gotten off the ark as well. All right, I've got another question for you. What's so important about dragon legends and old art that depicts an animal like a dinosaur? Well, I start answering that question by trying to think about, okay, where would we look for evidence mm-hmm. if, if, if the Bible, if what the Bible suggests is right and true, that these dinosaurs lived in the relatively recent past mm-hmm. thousands of years ago, went on Noah's Ark, lived with humans. I mean, that's really mm-hmm. weird to mm-hmm. most ears, um, but that seems to be how you fit dinosaurs into the Bible's mm-hmm. historical time frame. That means that dinosaurs would have gotten off the ark. Mm-hmm. And so where would we look for that evidence mm-hmm. that they may have lived uh, at the same time as people who lived way back then, thousands of years ago, mm-hmm. after the flood? 
And you, the thing is, you would not look in fossils. Right. Because the fossils are a record of the flood. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so if you look, if you find dinosaurs mm -hmm. in the flood rocks, those are the pre-flood dinosaurs that died in the flood, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, and so we don't see humans buried mm -hmm. with the dinosaurs, but we don't see horses mm -hmm. or deer either. So there's like swamp creatures and lake creatures and mm -hmm. sea creatures buried with dinosaurs, but mm -hmm. there's no hard ground living creatures. So that's not the right place to look right. for humans and dinosaurs coexisting if that's what we want to look and, for. And that's all part of the flood record anyway. Yes. So you're looking at dinosaurs are wiped out at a certain level in the flood, and that's mm -hmm. what my research is showing. Okay. And then above that, you have most of your common mammals like the horses and so you've got and the horses, you expect to find humans. They're in layers. They're in flood layers, but they're way up. Way up above right the here. dinosaurs. Uh, above the dinosaur layers. And in the so, post-flood world, you need to make a fossil. You got to have things buried fast and deep, and that's the key. People forget you got to bury things fast and deep. And then it has to dewater pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it'll just if it if it sits right, in, it'll, it, it'll dissolve away. It'll dissolve and mm -hmm. rot. Uh, so so. The fact that we even have a world full of continents mm -hmm. that have rock layers that have mm -hmm. fossils and uh, every continent has mm -hmm. dinosaur fossils mm -hmm. really is powerful evidence for the flood. But I'm coming back around to answering your question. Where would we look for evidence mm -hmm. that humans and dinosaurs may have interacted in the past after the flood? It would be artifacts. Right. It'd be, it would be records. It would be artwork that mm -hmm. our ancestors mm -hmm. did. And so we have that on display, mm -hmm. some of it, just a taste mm -hmm. here at the Discovery right, Center. Right behind you. Over right behind me, right. And so, boy, so, now most dragon legend artwork is really is legendary. It's mm -hmm. like imaginary mm -hmm. creatures. Most of it is like, well, that's, we don't know anything alive today that looks like that. We don't know anything uh, extinct, known from fossils mm -hmm. that looks like that. And in fact, it looks like a hodgepodge of mm -hmm. bits and bobs of animal parts mm -hmm. that some artists cobbled together, mm -hmm. you know, for fun, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's not what we're talking about. That's not, those aren't really historical, actual creatures. Mm -hmm. But some of these, every once in a while, you find a diamond in the rough, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like, well, that's the exact anatomy mm -hmm. of what we know from fossils. That's right. And those are the interesting ones. And we do see written records, like even in the Bible, in the book of Job, we mm -hmm. see description of behemoth and leviathan which i think are certain types of dinosaurs and have interpreted them uh, if you read through the description of them how they all fit you know the teeth and you know the, the hard skin the impenetrable skin you know which is what you see in reptiles very very thick skin sometimes 40 layers thick and these things are really really tough skin just like crocodiles their backs are very very tough uh, and dinosaurs probably some of them might add even thicker skin and scales and and so it's, you know, there's a lot of evidence in the rocks of dinosaurs, but when you get to the post-flood world, without those conditions to bury them, you're not going to get uh, fossils, or really of anything. You, know, you don't see fossils, you see some Ice Age fossils, but dinosaurs didn't live near the ice. They had to have warmer climates, I believe. And so they were living far from where the ice sheets were and where the sediments were being deposited from these catastrophic melting even of the ice. And so you don't have dinosaurs as fossils in the post-flood world, and you wouldn't expect it. I wouldn't expect it either, mm -hmm. and yeah, we don't have, yeah, I agree, it's, mm -hmm. but it's this artwork, it's mm -hmm. really interesting, and we've got, we've got artwork that, I mean, one of the interesting pieces of art that I've, that, that I've encountered is, for example, in Barcelona, there's an altarpiece um, from the Middle Ages, Mm -hmm. And uh, it shows a, a depiction of St. George and the dragon. St. George, okay. not sure if he existed, but let's pretend he did. Whoever did that art had to choose some kind of anatomy to represent the dragon. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that this particular artist chose a very unique anatomy, mm -hmm. not known from other St. George and the dragon depictions, mm -hmm. which are all over Europe. But this one's unique, and it's got these teeth that go outside the mouth. Mm -hmm. So when it closes yeah. its mouth, its teeth are outside. And um, the length of its legs to body mm -hmm. ratio, the whole body length in proportion to St. George on a horse, it's all exactly precise from what we know from fossils mm -hmm. of Nothosaurus, okay. which is in rock layers below the dinosaur rocks. Mm -hmm. But what we've been saying all along is that the flood deposited mm -hmm. the dinosaur rocks and the layers below it. Correct. And the, all these layers 
were deposited mm -hmm. in just one year. Mm -hmm. And we've been, we've been saying that, uh, mm -hmm. believing that for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that not just the dinosaurs, but the, um, but these other extinct reptiles mm -hmm. would have gone on board the ark too. Right. And even mammal-like reptiles mm -hmm. that we see buried in rock layers sometimes mm -hmm. above uh, dinosaurs. So, so when we see artwork that looks like, oh, well, the, the, this creature <laughs> lived, mm -hmm. This creature lived right on through uh, up until the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. you know, because, because someone knew the exact anatomy. And many uh, of the depictions actually had the legs coming straight down. Like you talked about at the very beginning. For yeah. dinosaurs. For, for these dragons. Dinosaur, and but... For some of these dragons and things, you see many of them have their legs coming straight down. Yeah, all the an anatomy really and works. so, you know, people, if they were doing reptiles today, they would draw them sprawling. Because mm -hmm. that's what we see today. So, so it does, like you say, it, it works. But the, kind of the second part of that question is, who in the Bible may have actually seen or interacted with dinosaurs? Well, you answered it by saying Job, right? Yeah. And so you, you talk about Job's mm -hmm. behemoth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've read in theological mm -hmm. um, books, mm -hmm. commentaries on the book of Job, where theologians say, Mm -hmm. Some say it could have been mm -hmm. a dinosaur, but we know that can't be right because yeah. dinosaurs, can you fill in the blank? Went extinct millions of years ago. Exactly, because so, dinosaurs went extinct so they're taught in the that prehistoric in school as well. times. Mm -hmm. Which, what is that? There's, that's not in the Bible. Yeah. but um, uh, So, in other words, it's circular reasoning. It's right. like it can't be dinosaurs. Therefore, it must because be something they, else. Yeah, therefore, it must be something else. But let's let the text mm -hmm. define what the creature is. Mm -hmm. and, and others, others get around it by saying, Maybe behemoth was, you know, imaginary. Yeah. But what would be the point of God saying, imagine a creature, mm -hmm. and now I'm greater than what you can imagine. Right. No, he's saying, this is a real creature, and mm -hmm. I'm a real God who's really greater than what you're looking at. Yeah. That's the whole point of the passage. Right. So it's got to be a real creature, but it's the chief of the ways mm -hmm. of God, which mm -hmm. I think refers to um, the biggest mm -hmm. land just, creature mm -hmm. God ever made. And some of the other anatomical mm -hmm. details right. from the passage you're familiar with. Right. Such as? Well, the sharp teeth on the Leviathan, anyway, really sharp teeth. And we're going to get to later on about dinosaurs spitting fire. Uh, Leviathan actually had smoke or fire, like, coming out of its mouth. So I guess we can answer that now. Well, I, I, Do you think it really spit fire? What about the tail like a cedar? Yeah, we got to get well, that one. Well, oh, that's true. For behemoth. The behemoth, right. The tail that's like Job a cedar. 40, but you want to move to Job 41. Well, it's kind of, they're, kind of, they're kind of related, but, uh, yeah, the, uh, there's a lot of people that are in your commentaries, even your Bible, a little footnote will say it's a crocodile or a hippopotamus or something like that. But again, you've got to have, like you pointed out, a tail like a cedar. So if you have a cedar tree, you know, some sort of sauropod or a long-necked dinosaur like a patasaurus or brontosaurus would have had that feature, would have had that big tail sticking out, balancing its big long neck in the front. And the tail would have swayed, as you've talked about many times in your lectures, uh, would have swayed like a cedar back and forth as the animal walked and moved. It would have been kind of swayed in the back, just like a cedar tree would do in the wind. And so to say that something else, you know, and say it as a hippopotamus particularly, seems really preposterous. Hippo uh, tails, I've know, seen them. They're just like little, little bitty yeah. flappy things. And, they don't... and even a crocodile would sway because it's kind of dragging in there. Unless it's in the water, it kind of propels itself along. But it's not big enough to be a cedar tree, nor would it sway like a cedar. And it's implying open air. So like you say, the best interpretation, when you read it for the way the Bible's written, seems to describe two different types of animals, probably a, one that eats grass, which would be the probably sauropod for the behemoth, and then some sort of meat eater, which became a meat eater after the fall, you know, after the sin of Adam and Eve. Of course, that's when animals started eating each other. And we see the evidence in the rocks of that. Dinosaurs were actually eating each other. We see, we see their marks in the ones buried in the flood. So we know they were eating each other. That was one of the questions that somebody brought up. Uh, when did dinosaurs start eating each other? And that would be right, you know, sometime after the fall of Adam and Eve. Oh, yeah. So 1,656 years between creation mm -hmm. and the flood. That's Somewhere a long time to be eating one another and plenty mm -hmm. of time for the earth to have become filled with violence. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we say the earth was filled with violence. All the creatures mm -hmm. even God had to destroy because they were yeah. violent too. And we see that evidence of that in the... In the rocks. But so the other patriarchs, even Abraham, might have seen dinosaurs as well. Many of these other, you know, they just didn't mention it in the in the text, in the, in the Bible. Uh, it wasn't relevant, possibly, or wasn't necessary. 
but there are a lot of people after the flood and a few thousand, thousand years or two, maybe even up until the last thousand years, there might have been several types of dinosaurs still alive that people would have seen. Yeah, I think um, pterosaurs mm -hmm. might be might be the best creature mm -hmm. to um, the pterosaurs, flying reptiles, mm -hmm. known only from fossils today, all extinct, mm -hmm. but, but they would have gotten on board the ark right. too, the flying mm -hmm. reptiles. Right. And they would have gotten off the ark and repopulated mm -hmm. different places. Mm -hmm. And then for whatever reason, they eventually went extinct also. But um, not before, I think Moses put one on a stick and held it up. Yeah. Uh, and, and not before Isaiah described a fiery flying serpent. Mm -hmm. Fiery being, it emits mm -hmm. light somehow. Mm -hmm. um, That's the so, next question. Could dinosaurs or flying reptiles spit fire? Like in the in the Job forty one, it talks about Leviathan, mm. and you know, just like the flying reptiles, fiery flying mm. serpent in, in Isaiah. Mm. So, so so we do have bioluminescence, mm. and we even have sea creatures. Are of course mm. lots of sea creatures make their own light. Even sharks mm -hmm. glow, uh, have their bellies glow, just so that mm. creature uh, uh, fish swimming below the shark doesn't mm. even notice that it's. A, anything above it. Uh, and um, so bioluminescence is really mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, it shows us that God can build it, you know, a living structure that can make its own light. Why couldn't he build it? We also have electric eels mm -hmm. showing God can build biological structures mm -hmm. that shoot out electricity. Why not have one that shoots fire? Right. And that's what we have in Job 41 with mm -hmm. Leviathan. It's a it's a sea dragon type thing that sh that sh that could uh, breathe fire. Um, that's what the text says. Mm -hmm. And for us to say no, it couldn't do that, is for us to pretend like we were there mm -hmm. and we have some kind of observational evidence against what the eyewitnesses right. wrote down for us. They knew they were there. Um, God can do it, and so I believe it. This goes back to that story that in the previous chapter, Job forty-one about behemoth eating grass. Job 40. Yeah, sorry, Job 40. Go back to the previous chapter, Job 40. And so it talks about behemoth ate grass. And for years, secular scientists said there was no grass at the time of the dinosaurs. This can't be a dinosaur. There's no grass fossils found. And then in 2005, they found dinosaur, five types of dinosaur grass in the dung of dinosaurs found that were found with the bones of sauropod dinosaurs, long necked dinosaurs, just like we believe Behemoth probably was one of the long-necked dinosaurs. So, in fact, they really were eating grass, just like the Bible said all along. So, once again, the Bible was confirmed as correct and true, even though for years secular science and you know they scoffed at the idea that there was grass at the same time as dinosaurs. It wasn't supposed to evolve until later. It's just hard to fossilize grass; it gets all ripped apart. And and so, when they found it in the dung, it was actually compressed enough that it was. Just like horses, you find what they ate, you see their droppings, you can see what the dinosaurs ate. And they confirm, so they had to go back and change a lot of their paintings and a lot of their reconstructions of dinosaurs, including this thing, and put grass. Put a patch of grass here. Put a patch there. of grass in there, and that was kind of a shock to them. Yeah. And so just because we haven't found it doesn't mean it's not true. And so there's, you know, in the future, we may actually find some evidence that some sort of dinosaur, and with all the original tissues we're finding now in dinosaurs, maybe we'll find something that indicates these things did spit fire somehow. I think you missed your calling. You, you should have been a paleoscatologist. <laughs> well, and just, yeah. And just look at the dinosaur dung. Yeah, and they were finding... Copper light, well, you could have a big collection of copper lights. How wonderful would well, that Well, they were doing that back in the 19th century. They were actually taking copper lights from ichthyosaurs, swimming mm -hmm. reptiles, and they were actually putting them in water, and they would start to smell again. Yeah. It's because there's so much original you know, tissues even in that. And so it's uh, people were studying for a long time. Geologists were... We gave it up because it... I don't know why. <laughs> All right, let's move on. How long could dinosaurs live, do you think? Well, I think we disagree on this one. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> we don't always agree, but most, most things. How long do you think they could live? Did they live longer before the flood? That's kind of the Well, here's, here's the bottom line answer is we don't have any living dinosaurs mm -hmm. to measure mm -hmm. how big they grow, how fast mm -hmm. they grew. And some may have, may have grown faster mm -hmm. in different circumstances. Um, maybe the males grew faster mm -hmm. and bigger and the females mm -hmm. not so much or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So 
there's a lot of unknown. Yeah. So I think we're really moving into the realm of right. speculation. And and some experts who look at the um, they look at osteons, which are these bone structures inside the bone, microscopic structures. Mm -hmm. So you cut the bone, mm -hmm. thin section it, look at a microscope. Oh, look, if there's these rings, it's like growth mm -hmm. rings on a tree. Mm -hmm. And they say, because there's five rings here, this must be a five-year-old dinosaur. But for every guy who says that, there's mm -hmm. another guy or gal who says, mm -hmm. no, that's a two-year-old or that's a 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. And it's just that the pattern here mm -hmm. is different than the actual age. And so it's just so debated that I don't, it's not really a hill I want to die yeah. on. What well, I think, think the really small ones, I think maybe, you know, somewhat accurate on them. You know, they can see a couple growth rings. And as they got bigger, if you can find enough of them, that's the part of the problem is you, you can't find enough of a, of a package from hatchling all the way to large adult size. There's only a few dinosaur species where they can actually kind of do that to some respects. But they do see a pattern. But eventually, other people, other experts in paleontology have said that at a certain point, you don't you no longer get rings, and so they're really just minimum ages. So early on, you can count the rings, because and then, bone and then later you can't. Right. Bone gets rebuilt consist mm -hmm. continuously. So if you're old, mm -hmm. you the rebuilt bits bore through or replace mm -hmm. those old ring structures right. that you that your bone obtained when you were younger. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes hard to discern how old is this mm -hmm. bone. I don't know. Well, it's been restructured a couple of times, so mm -hmm. he could be. Five or fifty. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. So they, they, you know, the oldest T. Rex is supposed to be Tyrannosaurus rex Sue, named after Sue Hendrickson who found it, and it's about the size of this thing behind us, and it's supposed to be about twenty-seven years old, if I remember right, because they count growth rings. But I, I, I still think that's a minimum age. I think that thing was much older. The, all the damage and the broken bones that healed. But I was amazed at how many broken bones and how many diseases these uh, animals had, and I think it's because they're much older. I think that many of the dinosaurs, and this is where be, maybe where we disagree, I think that dinosaurs in the pre-flood world might have lived to be, you know, seven, eight hundred years old, just like the humans. Is that once they got big, they were safe from predators. You know, big was safe, just like elephants today. The young elephants are susceptible to getting killed. The young animals are the most susceptible to getting killed. Once you got big, you were pretty safe. And so these big animals, you know, it helped, it behooved them, so to speak, for them to get big fast. How Certainly fast they true. did, we don't know, but Certainly true with sauropods, right? Because they didn't no. have armor plating. No. They didn't have. They weren't going to have anything. Some of them had tail spikes, but yeah. not very many. So their defense was mm -hmm. to get big fast. So they grew fast. Mm -hmm. and yeah, they weren't going to run anything I either. So. I think there's evidence uh, in the bones mm -hmm. to support that. So the biggest, mm -hmm. I think they, I think they obtained their big size, mm -hmm. you know, within 20 years. Mm -hmm. And they, That's I think right. they continue to grow bigger. There's, there's conflicting evidence on that, but many reptiles today seem to keep growing bigger. There's some, they say, reach a determinate size. And that gets into the whole warm-blooded, cold-blooded thing. You know, and I lean to the side of dinosaurs being cold-blooded. To me, it makes more sense why they went extinct ultimately after the flood because the climate was different in the pre-flood world. It was a little colder areas, much more harsh. It might have even been changes to the amount of CO2 and oxygen in the atmosphere, and that's debatable as well. But a lot of those things could have happened during the flood as you're making limestone, pulling things out of the air to make calcium carbonate, you got to pull CO2 out of the air. And so there could have been a big change in the atmosphere uh, in the pre-flood and post-flood world. Uh, I think too often we make the flood too small. You know, it actually affected the atmosphere, I believe, the crust, not just the sediments, not just the fossils. Things were completely changed from the pre-flood to the post-flood. And that affected how dinosaurs, and if they were cold budded, which I think there is strong evidence to support that, how they could have survived in the post-flood world. They had a much more limited range of where they could live, you know, the equatorial regions. They couldn't live up in the great north, especially right after the flood when there was an ice age, they would have had to force them further south uh, from where the ark landed. And they would have had to live in these climates, you know, a little tough climates for them to survive in. And so many animals today even go extinct, you know, because of long-term climate change, long-term, you know, their vegetation that they ate is being wiped out. And it isn't always caused by humans. It's, you know, of course, we push the envelope. We might have helped push the envelope on the dinosaurs as well. Uh, but ultimately, I believe they went, they went extinct. They were diminishing in number because the conditions after the flood were so different than before the flood. But they were around for a long, long time. I can go with most of that. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Okay. But here's the part I okay. wonder. How can you say they were not warm-blooded? 
because they have to be warm-blooded in order to evolve into birds, which we know dinosaurs <laughs> evolved into birds, right? Well, that's the story they're, they're spreading now in the secular world. The dinosaurs were birds and vice versa. I'm like, we disagree with that totally here at ICR. That's like, that's like the yeah. professor who told mm -hmm. the students, you're a fish, mm -hmm. whether you're just a highly evolved fish, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. You know, that's a quote yeah. from the textbook. Uh, it, it, it's like... Yeah. This is so imaginary that what world are we living in? Uh, you know, you know, because fish are different mm -hmm. than people. Right. And that there, there is actually uh, fossil evidence to support the cold bloodedness. There's, you know, you look. The people have studied the skulls of dinosaurs, different types of dinosaurs, and they show there's no these turbinates, these things that warm the air as you breathe in, that most mammals have. Dinosaurs didn't have those things. Even their eggs, they took longer to hatch than you know most birds and most warm-blooded animals. Their eggs have been shown to take, you know, months, several months to hatch, similar like crocodiles and, and alligators do. And so was, there's a, quite a bit of evidence, you know, scientific bone evidence to support that they were cold-blooded. It's just become popular since the 60s and 70s to push dinosaurs being warm-blooded. And then to go back to the old 19th century idea of dinosaurs are birds. And now you're seeing people out there saying dinosaurs had feathers and, and uh, I'll, maybe I'll let you kick on that one. That's one of the questions coming up. Were dinosaurs, in fact, yeah, did they funny. have feathers? You know, were they warm-blooded and did they have feathers? But before I let, let you go on that, to make a dinosaur into a bird, you got to first make them warm-blooded. And so I think that's the first step that they took in the 70s and 80s that started pushing dinosaurs were warm-blooded. Even though the evidence is not strong, there's some evidence to support, you know, there are some similarities between certain types of dinosaurs and birds. But there's a lot that they disregard the evidence that really supports, I think, that dinosaurs are not related to birds at all. But the cold-blooded evidence, I think, is still strong. And so, but they don't want to hear about that. You know, that's now heresy in the secular world to talk about dinosaurs being cold-blooded, even though there's a lot of evidence that's out there. If you dig through the evidence, and I did this for a lab and I taught at a, a public college, I looked through, I said, okay, what's the evidence for cold-blooded? What's the evidence for warm-blooded? And I found there's a lot of evidence in the bones, like the turbinates, lack of turbinates and things, to show that dinosaurs very well could have been cold-blooded. And that's a big problem if you're trying to turn them into birds. Yeah, because to, to, do, to do that transformation, you mm -hmm. have to reorganize like mm -hmm. all the organs, all the organ systems, the cells, mm -hmm. uh, because, um, and even proteins, mm -hmm. specific individual mm -hmm. proteins mm -hmm. within cells, because your metabolism mm -hmm. is integrated and all these different organs mm -hmm. and organ systems and different levels of organization within mm -hmm. within a creature. Uh, so to so yeah, for I think for evolution or natural processes to make all those coordinated changes that would be required to mm -hmm. go from cold to warm mm -hmm. blooded metabolism, I think it's just a joke. Mm -hmm. I think it's a joke. As a biochemist, have one of my degrees mm -hmm. is biochemistry. So from that perspective, I'm, I'm looking at it from that from that lens, mm -hmm. going, well, you'd have to change, you have to change everything. You'd have to do a wholesale mm -hmm. rewrite. Mm -hmm. And um, but I, li I like that phrase you use, "cold blooded evidence." <laughs> I think that's that's I think that's the that title of your next book. Yeah, it was cold an accident. Cold blooded evidence. That was an accident, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but did dinosaurs? Did any of them have feathers? You hear this a lot in the creation community now as well. Uh, you know, you see this all yeah. the time in the news. Dinosaur, new feathered dinosaur, yeah. new feathered this, new feathered that. And we're constantly writing news articles saying, okay, if you read through the article, what does the article really say? Well, let me start with sort of a few anecdotes. Okay. Because that's more fun to talk about than okay. articles. Uh, but it did start with an article. My anecdote is that uh, I went to a museum in San Antonio, mm -hmm. and it showed a T-Rex model, a small T-Rex, absolutely mm -hmm. covered with feathers. It looked mm -hmm. ridiculous. <laughs> but maybe that's what it was, you know, mm -hmm. I, who am I to say mm -hmm. I wasn't there, mm -hmm. but it just didn't seem to fit. And it was just covered with feathers. And of course they put, you know, lots of colored feathers. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, a lot of folks out there who believe that, that even some of the Tyrannosaurids, the smaller mm -hmm. ones maybe had feathers. Mm -hmm. And some of the evidence for that would be like these fibers that they found associated mm -hmm. with the skeletons in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. And um, but other evolutionists have come along and said the fibers really look to us like decayed skin fibers because mm -hmm. you're when your skin decays it turns into little fibers. So so some folks turn those fibers into feathers. Well, does T. Rex mm -hmm. have feathers or not? Well, 
just a few years ago, another researcher went to actual preserved skin on mm -hmm. T-Rexes, and he found skin from the tail, which I saw mm -hmm. at the uh, Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. They've got this huge 30-foot-long T-Rex tail, original out of the ground, on display, um, and it's got, what, skin that's sucked right down onto the bone, because mm -hmm. that's what happens when a carcass sort of mummifies. Mm -hmm. um, and that skin is covered with bumps, reptile scales, mm -hmm. no feathers on the tail. And other specimens, mm -hmm. actual from the rock, mm -hmm. not speculations about fibers and feathers, show uh, from its belly, from its head, from every major body part, T-Rex was scaly skin, mm -hmm. scaly skin, mm -hmm. scaly skin. So the whole, so then I was like, okay, T-Rex did not have feathers. So then, so then I'm like, well, what else are they saying had feathers, but the best science shows it was not feathers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have not yet seen a feathered dinosaur. A truly dinosaur feathered being dinosaur. open acetabulum, mm -hmm. uh, uh, open hip bone, mm -hmm. that's a dinosaur, and then feathers on that. I haven't seen that yet, so I'm waiting to see that. Well, about so a year or two ago, they actually did a big study of the Tyrannosaurs, and they said Tyrannosaurs didn't have feathers, but all the other theropods did. Mm. You know, because they, they know they did because they turned into birds. Right. But they actually did a study, probably using that specimen you talked about, and others, and and they yeah. determined that dinosaurs, the T. Rex type, the you know the theropods of the Tyrannosaur family, didn't have feathers. But they think you know, well maybe they when they're really young or or other, but other ones do. They always put them on Velociraptor. They love to put feathers on Velociraptor, but there's really very little evidence of any feathers on a Velociraptor. They're right. really kind of pushing the envelope. It's almost where they're writing science fiction and calling that science. I think so. And yeah, in order to mm -hmm. get your dinosaur into a bird, you got to mm -hmm. make it warm blooded mm -hmm. and you got to put feathers on it. Right. So we're finding fibers and turning those into mm -hmm. feathers, and we're finding active mm -hmm. movement, anatomy of active motion, mm -hmm. which we associate with warm bloodedness. We, and we make them warm blooded. So we're trying mm -hmm. to turn them in, yeah. evolutionists are trying to turn these creatures into birds. Um, but um, if you remove that bias, mm -hmm. what you have is the actual data, and it shows in the rocks we've got um, birds separate, mm -hmm. dinosaurs separate from birds, yeah. anatomy is different, mm -hmm. um, feathers in the birds, and no bona fide feathers yet for the dinosaurs right. that I've seen. Right. And, there, and there's a lot of the dinosaurs that they're saying have feathers are actually birds based on the yeah, anatomy. They call, it, they call it a bird, and guys, that's a dinosaur, and yeah. vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, Microraptor mm -hmm. is a four-winged, feathered dinosaur. Well, you know what? If it's got four wings and feathers, mm -hmm. we could call it a bird, right. <laughs> especially since, especially since we don't have the, uh, the, you know, the um, the, the the acetabulum. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a bird acetabulum. Mm -hmm. It's a bird. Yeah, yeah. Microraptor was a bird, and so let's just call it what it is. <laughs> All right. Is it possible? Do you think to clone a dinosaur? Could we ever clone one or bring one back? Now that we're getting, no. this leads into a little bit of the, the next topic, our final topic that we're going to get into, and that's the original tissues we're finding in dinosaurs. But to, to clone, from my understanding, being a non-biologist, you have to have an animal of that type to put the DNA in. You have to have, to make clone a sheep, you got to have a sheep. You've know, you you got to have a mama the, to right. make a baby. And there's no mama dinosaurs out there's there. There's no mama dinosaurs no, out so. there. So, so we can't clone them. Even if we had the complete DNA sequence, we couldn't make a dinosaur. You'd have nice, wonderful DNA. So what? But, and we showed that they probably were different than birds, just like we've been saying all along. The more you get, the more you'd find out they are different. So there's there's some hope maybe that they'll clone mm -hmm. a um, mammoth, but that's because there's living elephants to mm -hmm. use as mamas. Mm -hmm. But the DNA decays mm -hmm. so fast mm -hmm. that um, in order to... Yeah, you'd, first you'd have to get dino DNA, but that mm -hmm. doesn't really exist. There's little bits of it Snippets in, of, in some mm -hmm. specimens, well, that, which is incredible in itself. That but leads it us back to so that question. It so degraded yeah. in, over the last 4,500 years since the flood. It would be so degraded. You'd only have, you'd only have tiny fragments. Mm -hmm. It would be like a word mm -hmm. here and a letter there from an entire set of encyclopedias. And you need the whole set of encyclopedias mm -hmm. and a mama, the factory mm -hmm. that produces the site encyclopedias mm -hmm. in order to make another encyclopedia set. Oh. So all we have is little bits of letters uh, mm -hmm. from tattered papers. That's not enough to clone a dinosaur. Well, one thing that just came to my mind that I wanted to mention from as a geology standpoint and what's often neglected mm -hmm. with the turn into dinosaurs, trying to make dinosaurs turn into birds, is you have 
dinosaurs here in the rock record, you have birds down here, along with the dinosaurs. But the most bird-like dinosaurs are up here, and then in the you know in the Cretaceous rocks, the last of the dinosaur rock layers, you get them in the kind of get them in the mid to late Triassic, and then you get some dinosaurs in the Jurassic layers, and then you get dinosaurs in the Cretaceous, and they all kind of disappear. But the most bird-like ones that claim that dinosaurs are supposedly turned into birds are the ones in the upper Cretaceous. Well, we have feathered birds called Archaeopteryx down in the upper Jurassic layers. Below the dinosaurs. Which would be, you know, 50 million in the, in the secular worldview, 50 to 70 million years before these dinosaurs were most bird-like. And that is the biggest problem, in my opinion, is the rocks, again, support you have birds, you have dinosaurs. You got some birds that couldn't fly as well like Archaeopteryx. They've been doing studies and show Archaeopteryx flew like a pheasant. So it couldn't stay above the water as long as some birds and soar and soar ahead to land. And so these dinosaur or these birds got buried in with the dinosaur rocks earlier than many of the other birds that showed up, you know, later in the rock record because they just couldn't fly as well. These bony tailed birds that are now extinct today are really couldn't couldn't fly as well. And so they're caught in there. But you've got birds already. Why would they re evolve later? You know, yeah. why would you evolve them twice? You've already got these birds. And that's often neglected in this story that the secular world is spinning out there. Oh, dinosaurs are one blooded, dinosaurs are birds, blah, blah, blah. But, well, how do you explain that you've already got birds way below in the rocks down buried earlier in the flood than the most bird like dinosaurs? And even those bird like dinosaurs have the wrong kind of hips. You know, they balance differently, as you pointed out. The, if you kind of pull their legs down to make them walk like a dinosaur, these birds that have feathers, they'd fall over. And Dave Menton has actually mentioned that as well and pointed it out to me the first time. And then you've Affirm that in your description. Yeah, when birds walk, they they, walk they move from their knees. Mm -hmm. But when dinosaurs walk, they moved mm -hmm. at the hips. Like the lucky, thighs, are, yeah, the thighs, the thighs are kind of inside on your chickens and stuff. Yeah, yeah the thighs are more rigid to hold to hold the uh, to hold its shape, so, to hold those air sacs on the inside, and to, so if you pull the legs down forward. and walk like a dinosaur does, they'd fall over. They'd be too front heavy. Front heavy, yeah. And so it's it's difficult. It's it's more difficult than they make it out to be. They just think, oh, if you change a little bone here and there, and you got it. But like as you said earlier, that they forget all the physiological changes that have to come along with it as well. There's yeah, many a whole things. suite of changes that so we had, at the same time. We it have, just doesn't happen. Right. Like we that. have feathered extinct birds with bony tails like Archaeopteryx and Microraptor. And then we have to to our recollection, to our knowledge today, there are no feathered dinosaurs. Everything we see is skin, scaly skin, scaly skin, scaly skin, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scaly skin dinosaurs that you can see the replicas of, including the T-Rexes. All right, our last question. We're getting there. And this is your expertise. This is what you got your PhD in. What's so important about finding soft tissues in dinosaur fossils? Well, so the, give us your the, dissertation in a nutshell. Yeah, right. <laughs> when you say tissues, you're not mm -hmm. talking about Kleenex. You're talking about like blood mm -hmm. vessels and mm -hmm. uh, connective tissue, like actual tissue, including cells. Osteocyte cells, cells, yeah. Not just osteocyte, but uh, other cells too. And um, boy, that that's not supposed to be in any kind of you know any kind of fossil mm. that's that's a million years old or more, mm. uh, supposedly years. So what we've been saying is that the flood deposited these layers 4,500 or so years ago. All these layers, mm -hmm. and so the including the dinosaur layers. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case. Um, then maybe there's some, maybe there's tissue in there mm -hmm. that could have lasted for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And we know that certain proteins can last, mm -hmm. tissues are made of proteins, mm -hmm. can last thousands of years. Um, but they can't last a million at, uh, you know, at Earth's surface temperatures. You'd have to get it liquid that, nitrogen that, to get that, it. That's even under ideal conditions. Ideal. Unlike what's exposed, like in Montana, we got freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw, right near the surface, water trickling in bacteria you know, action it's, it's yeah so life is rough for mm -hmm. a protein underground uh it's, and, and mm -hmm. with more time you know there's more opportunities for chemistry mm -hmm. to happen and for bacteria to de mm -hmm. to uh degrade it and for chemistry to decay it so um and then there's radiation that would mm -hmm. breaks apart these molecules yeah. but they're still inside the bones which makes us think that hey the flood got it right mm -hmm. you know the flood really is is the explanation for how you get fossils in the first place, how you get rock layers, and how you get 
tissues mm -hmm. still in on this because it's recent. Mm -hmm. So to me, this says the Bible got it right. If the Bible's right about where we came from, then it's right about who we are mm -hmm. and our need for a Savior Amen. And, and where we're going. Mm -hmm. And where are we going? <laughs> where are you going? Uh, so so that's, that introduces us to the gospel. And the Bible gives us the plan. The plan is, I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. I can't save myself. But God, God can. God can. God provided the way through Christ. By, him, by God himself coming as a human. You know, allowing himself to be killed, nailed to a cross, shedding his blood, and then rising from the dead. You know, he conquered death. And he, and he paid the price for all of our sins, you and I and everybody else in the world. So our death sentence can be removed, and mm -hmm. all we have to do is say, I turn from sin, and I trust in Christ. And that, mm -hmm. that message is in the Scripture. Mm -hmm. It's the same Scripture that teaches the flood. Mm -hmm. And this, these are the same rocks mm -hmm. that confirm the flood, and the right. same soft tissue fossils that confirm, confirm the flood. The recent flood, like the Bible talks about. The recent about. biblical flood. Because if you count the genealogies and you go through and count them, the earth's only thousands of years old, not yeah. millions, not billions. And, and to try to say that is, is, is very difficult when you look at the truth of the God's Word. And the truth of God's Word, if you believe that part, it's, you, know, you can believe the part that Christ himself was God, you know, came as a human. And he came to, to save us. Uh, you know, God loved us that much. Loved each and every of us, even though we're sinners. We're still sinners, but he's redeemed us. And so we won't have to face a judgment, like the judgment of the flood for people that were, the world was so wicked that he saved, you know, our remnant. Whoever wanted to believe could walk through that door of salvation on that ark. But only eight people walked through. And today God's there. You know, he's opened the door again to salvation through Christ, through his blood. We can just... Believe in Him and accept the truth of God's Word that, you know, God really lived and died as Christ and provides that perfect sacrifice for our sins that we've done. Amen. Couldn't have said it better. Thanks for joining us on our fun discussion about dinosaurs mm -hmm. that led to our need for a Savior. It's, it's always a pleasure, young man. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks for joining yeah, us. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video with Drs. Thomas and Clary talking about dinosaurs. If your question didn't get answered, you can pick up a creation Q&A booklet by going to store.icr.org. If you like this video, you can like it and share it with your friends and family. That way they'll be able to see it. And we hope to see you next week as we have an ICR scientist and a special guest talk about astronomy. That's next Friday at 10 a.m. We'll see you there.